please join me in the call to worship. It was the third day after the crucifixion. Heartsick, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. But the tomb was empty. And then the living Christ whispered her name. The living Christ calls us still, each of us by name, knowing our deepest hearts and loving us completely. Let this be a time of opening our whole selves to the power of the living Christ, who has broken through death's chains and invites us into life, renewed, Reborn, resurrected, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed.
have taught us yet again, love wins always and forever in every moment of every moment, love wins. No matter what we do, no matter who we show ourselves to be, no matter how lost and seemingly forsaken, love wins. Holy One, pour us full of your love. Pull us into your love and set us afire. Amen. You may be seated. And now let us come before this eternal source of love with our prayer of confession. Merciful one, only in you can we unmask the fear that rules our lives. We fear we will lose what we have, not get what we want, that the world is not going the way we want it to. Those fears are what lurk behind every wrong impulse, but perfect love casts out fear. And the only perfect love is the love to be found in you. Roll away the stone from our hearts and open our spirits to your love and life. Amen. Perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. In every fiber of your being, you are beloved. For the risen Lord would have it so. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Thank you. Please turn to your neighbor and extend that same grace and peace. You know, we're mixing it up just a little bit this morning, as you can tell. Um, in the traditional, in the Christian tradition going back centuries, it was the done thing to have the passing of the peace after the assurance of pardon. When everyone had been pardoned, then you could go and be very gracious and forgiving and uh, to your neighbor. That was the whole idea behind that. So um, when I ask you to take a moment and sign in on the fellowship pads that are in each pew, send them down, send them back, take a look, see who's worshiping with you this morning, and, and continue that whole gracious attitude. That'd be great. Um, if you have a prayer request, would you please fill out one of those prayer request cards and send them towards the side aisles? The ushers will pick those up, and we'll lift those up in prayer in just a few moments, and I wanted to call your attention to just a few things. Um, right after this service, you can go out in the hall and buy tickets to Covenant Cafe. That's coming up in April, and that is a silent auction, great food. The theme is, oh my gosh, I'm not seeing medieval feast. So if you're like a Ren Faire person, you get to wear your outfits. If you're not a Ren Faire person, you can come and watch people wearing their outfits. It's really fun. The food's going to be great. Raising money for for a mission for um, the youth um, this summer. Um, then also after you buy those tickets and get all that going, you can go on into gathering where Katie will be preaching on, so what are we to make of this? Um, coming up this week, a week from yesterday, we are hosting Glennon Doyle Melton, who is a best-selling author. She's the blogger who writes the blog Momastery. If you don't know them, I know you know someone who knows her. So um, she'll be here next Saturday. If you are able to help us with our hosting of that event, we're expecting about 450, maybe 500 people. So we can use some help. So um, talk to Katie Kinnison or to Tori Vasquez, and that would be wonderful. Um, next Sunday, thank you. Next Sunday, we are having an organ recital, an organ concert featuring Rachel Spry Lammy, and her information is two weeks. She's playing for church next Sunday. Her concert is the week after. See? Okay. You can, you can actually come back to church next Sunday and um, hear her, and then the following Sunday she'll be doing that recital. Um, let me see. Two other things I wanted to call your attention to. Um, if you're worried about climate change and you are, like many of us, thinking, what can I do? Well, here's something you can do. There is Faith Climate Action Statehouse Lobby Day on, on Wednesday, April 20th. Information right there. Also, on April 23rd, we are doing a poverty simulation. Um, we need to have a minimum of 40 people to take part in this. This is really, really a powerful experience. Um, you, you come and everybody gets a, a, a role play sort of description of what your circumstances are and then you have to find a way to, to make your way, navigate your way through 
all of the things that folks who are living in, in real poverty have to navigate every day. It gives us a brand new understanding um, in a very powerful way. So please, please um, sign up for that. You can see John Griffin, who's right there, um, or call the church office for more information. And now I invite the children to come on up for a few moments with Jim and whoever he has. Okay, we're going to do things a little different today. You need Kids, you need to sit out here. And um, adults, if you're carrying children, you're invited to use the chairs. And we're going to turn, we're going to turn this way and face, face this thing here. So if you want to come on over, have a seat out here. What's that? You did? So now if anybody, first things first, if anybody has any fish, if you have a fish, oh, we're happy to receive your fish. You can stick it right there. Thanks, Sally. And now, oh, Logan, you've got a whole bunch of fish. Wow, great. That's good. We'll pick them up later. Let's see what's going on here in Puppet World. You did? Great. Thank you. That's wonderful. What's, what's, what's the matter with you today? You look sad. Oh, I'm sad. Why are you sad? Well, I read in the Bible that Jesus died and he was put into a, a tomb. I'm sad. Well, I guess it was a tomb like this. Oh, yeah, I guess Jesus is in there. Well, I don't know. What do you think? You think we should open it up and look? Oh, I don't know. I don't want to see Jesus in there. Let's open and see what's in there. Are you ready? What is it? Nothing! That's right, because Easter is about nothing. Wow. Easter is about Jesus being alive. And that's why we say, Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Oh, wait a minute. You just don't want to sit around and celebrate Happy Easter. You have to have a, you have to celebrate a little bit. You know, have an Easter egg hunt. Or, 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 how can you celebrate without confetti? Come on, grab some, let's have a party. Yay! Yay! Good work, guys. Oh, wow, who's going to clean this up? Okay, kids, ready? Confetti, confetti. Ready, confetti. confetti. Yeah. Okay, oh. Well. So what do you say about Easter? Confetti. No, 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 no. You say what? What do you say? Happy Easter! Thank you all very much. And someone, if you're allowed to go to, we can worship, oh, there we go. And if you need to go back with your parents and have a seat. But thank you and happy Easter to everybody. Don't forget. Don't forget your things. Oh, look at that. Wow. And your blanket.
Sí. Let us lift our hearts in prayer. Merciful God, we come before you with all praise, giving thanks for your faithfulness in raising Jesus from the dead. We give you thanks that because he lived, died, and rose again, we have gained a vision of your eternal order. Since he taught us how to love our neighbor, dividing walls of hostility may no longer keep us apart. We give you thanks that all our days can now be lived with assurance, with confidence that in Christ we may dwell in your favor. Fill us with hope as we consider Christ's resurrection for us all. We give thanks, O oh God, for this day. We give thanks for your abundant favor and goodness in all of our lives. We thank you for victories over sin and evil in our lives. We give you thanks for loyalty and love of friends and family. We give you thanks, O oh God, for the renewal of late nature, the springing back to life of the earth and our own restoration to life through Christ. God of eternity, you are present with us because of Christ rising from the dead. And you persist on raising us to new life in him. We bring our prayers for the world in need of resurrection. We pray for a daughter who had emergency surgery yesterday. We pray for a young man who's being, after being hit by a car while jogging. We pray for wholeness and healing and well-being of all those we hold in our hearts. We pray for nations and people in strife. We pray for the poor, the homeless, the unemployed, the underemployed. We pray for those we know who are in particular circumstances of distress. God of mercy, we no longer look for Jesus among the dead, for he is alive and has become Lord of life. Increase in our minds and hearts the risen life we share with Christ. Now help us to grow as your people toward the fullness of eternal life with you. And so we pray in the name of our risen Lord Jesus, who has brought us together that we may pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Today's first scripture reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 19 to 26. The passage may be found on page 176 of the New Testament in your pew Bible. I invite you to follow along. Let us listen to the word of God. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, 
the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ, but each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. May God bless our understanding of his word.
Our second reading is from the Gospel according to John, and John's Gospel, it's kind of quirky. There are a lot of ways, well, first of all, it's very different from the other three Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're all kind of, like, even though they each have their distinctive voices, they sort of sing together in nice, tight, three-part harmony. They match up in a lot of ways. And then here's John out here, you know, singing scat or just going off on his own riffs there. The Gospel according to John has a lot of quirks to it, and one of the quirks is that there are these frequent references to the disciple Jesus loved, as opposed to all the other disciples. The beloved disciple. In other words, you know, the, the special one. And John never mentions this disciple by name. We assume because he didn't want to brag. Anyway, I suppose we could do worse than to think of ourselves as being extra loved. I invite you to listen for and hear the word of God as it's found in the gospel according to John. Chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been rolled away from the tomb. And so she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and I don't know where they have laid him. And then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb, and the two were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. And then Simon Peter following him, went into the tomb. And he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they didn't understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. And then the disciples returned to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. And when she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me, just tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned to him and said in Hebrew, Rabunai, which means teacher. And he said to her, don't hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go, go to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? 
Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength, our rock, our redeemer, for it is through Christ we pray. Amen. They all three see the same scene. They all three see the same scene and they each react to it or experience it differently. We have three characters here and you probably recognize them even if you have never cracked open a Bible in your life. You probably recognize the types. First of all, there is Peter. I just love Peter. If Peter were a dog, he would be a golden retriever. <laughs> Peter's always romping off ahead, trying to get somewhere first and romping back. Jesus, uh, Peter's always the first one to try and answer a question. He's so enthusiastic. He is so loving. He is so full of, full of energy. And, and, and he's bright. He's intelligent. And he's full of bravado. He really likes being the hero. And Jesus had a special nickname for Peter, called him the Rock, which you know just tickled Peter no end. But here he is, and there's no doubt at all that he has been very humbled by the events of the past few days. That the very night of Jesus' arrest, when all the guys came to arrest Jesus, Peter pulled out a sword. We have no indication that Peter even knew how to use a sword. And he pulled out a sword, and, and you can just imagine him saying, it's all right, Lord, I got this. And he starts swinging it around, and he, and he lops off the ear of one of the slaves of one of the high priests. He thinks he's being a hero. And Jesus, in the middle of his arrest, calmly reaches down, picks up the ear, puts it back onto the slave, and heals the guy. And then he turns to, to Peter and he says, put away the sword. Imagine Peter. And then, then later on, they're at the place where Jesus is being interrogated and he's being beaten inside the courts there. And out in the courtyard, somebody turns to Peter and says, hey, aren't you one of those guys with him? And accidentally, Peter denied knowing Jesus. It just slipped out three times. You can imagine how he's feeling. So he's, he comes to the tomb. He sees the evidence or not. And he walks away. He's a man who used to know the difference between the good guys and the bad guys, and now he doesn't even know. Now he doesn't, he doesn't even know who he is. He doesn't have any conclusions to jump to, maybe for the first time in his life. There's Peter. And then there's the other disciple. The disciple. You know, the one Jesus really loved. The better looking one. The more intelligent, insightful one. And I don't know if you caught this, because it was only mentioned twice in the Gospel reading, he could outrun Peter. He outran Peter. And he was the one who looked right into that tomb. He saw and believed. He believed. Easy peasy. He just, you imagine him going, yeah, Jesus said it. I believe it. That settles it. Oh, resurrection? Check. We're all good. And then we have Mary. She's just, she's got a story in her head. And she is not going to shake loose from that story. It's her story. She is sticking to it. Here's the story. The body was stolen by body snatchers. That's what she believes and that's what she is sticking to. She looks into the tomb and she sees these two bookend angels sitting on either end. Never occurs to her to ask what just happened here. The first time she peeked into the tomb, there weren't two angels sitting there. It doesn't occur to her to ask why the grave clothes 
that wrapped the dead body are all in a heap on the floor. Like, who steals a body but unwraps it first? It doesn't occur to her to ask why the head cloth that had been on Jesus' head has been tidily folded and rolled up into a handy travel size and tucked into the corner. She's not curious about any of this stuff because she has her one story and that is all she is concerned about. So the angels say, woman, why are you weeping? And she tells them her story. They've taken the body. I don't know where it is. And then she hears something behind her. She turns around and she sees someone else who says, woman, why are you weeping? Not only does she tell him the story, she starts to blame him because it's very possible this guy is responsible. And so she says kind of like, if you know, if you had anything to do with this, you, you tell me now and I will go and take care of it. She has this idea and nothing is going to shake it. I love this, this part of the story. We have one scene. We have three different people, and each one of them experiences it differently. And that's just like the Easter story for each one of us. But is it true? But is it true? Not just the story itself, but that's the question that each one of these characters asks themselves. Is it true? Is it true? And you know, Easter for all of us is this mashup of perceptions. You came in here with a story. You, you have a story. You have a life. You have circumstances. You have things that have been happening in your world, and, and you know what your story is, or at least what you think it is. You have the things in your life that bring you joy, and you have the things in your life that fill you absolutely with dread. Maybe, you know, maybe you're part golden retriever and part Eeyore, like Peter. You know, maybe you look out there and you think, oh my gosh, it's a shifting world out there, and there's, and there's beauty, and there's terror, and there, there scientific progress and climate change. And we don't know what the world's going to look like in a couple of decades. And you know what? Maybe we don't even know what it looks like now. Maybe we don't even know. And you may wonder with Peter exactly what difference this story makes in our stories. Exactly what difference this story makes in, like, the world. In, like, our world. In, like, the real world. And maybe, like Peter, you're not sure who's the good guys and who's the bad guys anymore. Maybe you're just kind of waiting to make any conclusions. And if it is true, then what? Or maybe you're like the beloved disciple. Maybe you know your love. Maybe you know that. Maybe there's not a doubt in your mind. Maybe you feel it. Maybe you know it. Maybe you just are very, very confident of how loved you are. And maybe it's simple for you. But you know, for a lot of us, it's not always that simple. We get it here. We get it intellectually. We can understand, yes, God is love. Yes, death is temporary. Death does not have the last word. Yes, love wins. Yes, we can understand how Jesus breaking through, breaking through death frees us of our fears and our anxieties and, and allows us to, to access that peace and that courage and even the joy of Jesus Christ. We have it up here. We can understand that. But getting it down to the heart and down to the soul is sometimes a very slow process. And sometimes we're just like Peter and we're going like up. I got this. I got this, Lord. It's fine. I heard it. I understand it. I got this. And a lot of us, a lot of us, you know, we, we give it to God. Everything. Here's my life. Oh, except that one. And, and I'm going to, I'll take care of this one. And just give it back. We do that a lot. We do that a lot. Sometimes I think we're on like this big 
big old rubber band where, where as much as we understand it, we just snap back to this place where, where we think it's all about us. Sometimes I envy the disciple, the, the special disciple, the one who, who knew all the time how really loved he was. And then sometimes I think maybe it wasn't so easy for him either. We just get what he wrote down. And then, of course, there's Mary. We have Mary with her story, and she is so certain of the story. She blames the body snatchers. Do you ever wonder if you can step back a little bit and look at the stories that you hold on to? Because we all have stories that we are really invested in. And sometimes, like with Mary, they're stories of blame. They're stories of blame where we have sort of a list of people and institutions and circumstances that have wronged us. Blame is one of the juiciest fruits there is. Blame is delicious. Blame is wonderful. You know why? Because we get to, we get to be the innocent, guiltless victim whose only fault was maybe trying too hard or being too nice or being too trusting. Blame is great, except it's a blinding soul killer. Because when we are blaming, it prevents us from seeing the things, no matter how small, that we did to contribute to something. Or it prevents us from seeing how we are human too, and under certain circumstances, we may well have behaved exactly the same way as those we are blaming. It makes us think that we're somehow separate, that we're somehow different, that we're somehow not so human. And then something happens. And then something happens, something, you know, something personal, a diagnosis, an infidelity, a grief, a child disappearing into addiction, or a parent or a spouse disappearing into dementia. It could be a glass ceiling. It could be a glass floor, you know, where the bottom drops out. It could be a glimpse of apocalypse or a glimpse of dystopia. And at first, we're like Mary. We hold on to our story. We hold on to our story. They shouldn't have. Oh, if only I had. And we ask the angels and we blame Jesus and we cry. And then something speaks our name. Something speaks our name and says, you. Yeah, yeah, yes, you. You with, with your brokenness, with your well-meaning heroics, with your denials, with your stumbling and your bumbling, and oh, even the things that you knew as you were getting into them, even when you knew that it would be destructive, but you just felt compelled and you did it anyway, you. You, you are loved. That God's love does not even stop with any of that. That God's love is big enough to hold the whole thing. And there is yet a future for you in that love. It's that voice that says, you, you really are the beloved. You. Yeah. It's the voice that says, you, yes, you. This is the story that breaks open all the other stories. It breaks open our stories, blows them away like some powerful spring storm, and it cracks open the uncertainties that we have held on to that limit our awareness and that get in the way of our living lives that are full of life. Lives that shine the light of inextinguishable light in a world that is hell-bent on extinguishing it. 
But is it true? It may well be the only thing that is. It may well be the only thing that can save the world. Whether or not we open ourselves to that persistent love of God may be the one determining factor in the salvation of this beautiful earth and every one of God's beloved children. So, is it true? The ministry, mission, death, and resurrection of Jesus have become the cornerstone of our faith. Our faith, which compels us to send this message, to take this message, this good news into the world. And through our tithes and offerings, the message goes forth.
thank you, O God, for the resurrection. As you offered Christ to the world, we offer ourselves. With our gifts, we give ourselves to extend the good news of Easter to the whole world. Amen. And now let us go from this place as people who are sent. Wherever you go this week, consider that God is sending you there. And wherever you find yourself this week, consider that God is placing you there. That the love of Christ, which dwells within you, can reach out and touch others through you. Know this and go in Christ's love and peace and power. Amen.